knowledge and information. This is the theme of this year's edition of Global Access. The importance of knowledge has been evident to man since the beginning of time. But the Information Society presents new questions. How does the increasingly intense flow of information affect our ability to maintain a holistic understanding of the world? And does it actually make us smarter or dumber? More information leads to less knowledge. This according to technology journalist and author Nicholas Carr. Once a great enthusiast of the digital society, Carr is now one of its strongest critics. Here in conversation with Matthias Heseros. Nicholas, you were one of the pioneers in critiquing our so-called internet society. First of all, why did you do that? It, it started as kind of an exercise in personal diagnosis in, in a way because I had been uh, a technology writer for quite a long time, a big enthusiast about computers and uh, in the internet. Um, but I noticed as I was spending more and more time in front of a computer screen that I seemed to be having trouble concentrating on other things, reading a, a long book or reading even an article. Um, I noticed that, that my behavior seemed to be changing, that, that I wanted, my, my, or my mind wanted to behave the way it behaves when I was uh, in front of a screen, which it wants lots of stimulus, lots of information coming in different ways. Um, and I was, I was getting very nervous that I was losing my ability to pay attention, to, 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 to screen out distractions and focus my mind. And so I began looking at you know, the history of technology and, and how it influences the way people think. And kind of it grew from this, this personal <laughs> concern into a more general concern about how the technology was influencing us in what I came to conclude was, a, was quite a deep way. And what were your sort of findings when you started to explore this area? Yeah, so, so uh, the research kind of took two paths. Um, one path was into, back into history to look at other forms of what I came to call intellectual technologies, the kind of tools we use to think with, to organize information, communicate information, express ourselves, and, and so forth. So, so going back to maps and clocks and onto the printed book. And, and what I found there was a story about how when we adopt, when, when our ancestors adopted these technologies, it did change the way they thought about things. Uh, certainly the, the map changed the way people thought about space, the clock changed the way people thought about time. Um, and what I came to, to see from the historical study is that you know, within each of these intellectual technologies, there's a certain bias for, for how we should be using our minds. And, and the technology itself encourages the types of thinking that the, that the tool is good for and can discourage other types of thinking. So that was one stream of research, and the other was looking into brain science. Because you know, my first reaction was, this is just a tool, and I'm using it. And it doesn't seem probable that it would have a deep influence, deep and lasting effect on how I think. So it would change my cognitive processes, even when I wasn't using the technology, even when I wasn't sitting in front of the screen. And that opened up kind of a whole, whole nother um, field of evidence about how our minds are really quite adaptable. Uh, they're constantly adapting. Our brains adapt to our circumstances, to our environment. It's called, brain science is called neuroplasticity. And I think if you, if you think about how our environment, the environment in which we think, has changed over the last, say, 20 years, the big change has been technology, that we're, we're getting information through screens, whether it's computers or now smartphones. Um, we're, ex we're expressing ourselves through social media. Um, and so both of those, the, those strands of research pointed to certainly the possibility that our love <laughs> uh, for the technology and the amount of time we spend using it um, could indeed have a deep influence on our thought processes. What would be the... In what way has it impacted us the most? So you, you mentioned concentration, for example. Would that be the, uh, the, the main impact of the information technology or, um, or, the, or the other things? Well, I think, I think there are quite a few things. But 
You know, to put this in context, I first started writing about this really in, back in 2008, um, so t at least 10 years ago. Um, and that was, a, that was a time when people, when we, talk, when we use computers, we were talking about desktop computers and laptop computers. Uh, the iPhone had just been introduced in late, I think, uh, 2007, so it was really new. Um, and, and what I, at that time, and I was really studying the effects of web pages, surfing the web, using Google, using the internet, it did seem that that distraction and interruption was the big problem here. That, that this was a technology that we were using to gather all sorts of information, but it was a technology designed um, to distract us, uh, to, you know, it was a multimedia technology, so you could send text, and you could send music, and you could send video, and often when you looked at how people, and this, be, this came through the behavioral, came out clearly through the behavioral research, when you studied how people acted when they were online, what you saw is they were constantly shifting their focus. You know, even, even the best web page, the best quality web page uh, with interesting information, people would spend about 10 seconds on it and then click on a link and go somewhere else. So the way the technology was designed with hyperlinks and, and, and multimedia was really all about keeping people moving very, very quickly through information. And it, what I saw was it, not only did it do that, but it actively discouraged contemplation or reflection, all the types of thinking that requires us to slow down, to reduce the level of stimulus, and really to, to be attentive to one, you know, one line of thought or one line of reasoning or even a piece of music or a piece of art or whatever. So, so I think in the, the, way it, the way the problem manifested itself to me, and I think to others at the time, was very much about a story about distraction and interruption and the kind of aggressive, <laughs> uh, aggressive attempt to actually prevent us from slowing down. You mentioned design here, but could one say it's also embedded in the technology in itself? What, 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 what? Was it? What is it? Is this is this part of sort of a digital economy, or is it, or is it part of the techno te te uh, technology in itself? I think it, I think it's all of those things. I, I mean, I think it's part of the technology itself. That that because we're dealing, it's good to back up before everything was digitized. If you think about the information environment that existed in what we'll call the analog age, the mm -hmm. pre-digital age. The nature of supplying information meant that you had to go to lots of different devices or lots of different technologies. If you wanted to listen to music, you put a record onto a turntable, or you turned on a radio. If you wanted to watch television, you turned on your television. If you wanted to see a movie, you went to the movies. If you wanted to read about news, you'd get a newspaper, maybe some longer pieces, you'd get a magazine. Very longer pieces, you'd get a printed book. So there was this diversity of tools, and they were all specialized. Um, and they tended to, to encourage us to focus on one stream of information, whether it was entertainment or news or a novel or whatever. Um, once all of those things were digitized, they all were able to be supplied through a single device, whether it's a computer or a phone. Um, and so I think it's the nature, to use a funny term for technology, the nature of digital technology to push lots of information in many different forms simultaneously to us. Um, I think that's been, that fundamental capability has been exaggerated with design decisions. Uh, I think, for instance, technologists, Silicon Valley in particular, very much, very much believe that simply supplying as much information as quickly as possible is the way to enhance knowledge or keep people better informed. And they don't really think more broadly about how does our mind take in this information? Uh, how do we make sense of it? How do, we, how do we turn this information into knowledge? All of which are very different processes. Um, but they really look at, and, and this suits their kind of engineering perspective, they, they focus on the throughput of data, the way, the, way you, the way you'd optimize a computer itself or a computer network, and they apply the same thing to our, to our minds. Um, so I think it's both kind of inherent in digital media, um, but then it's been exaggerated by these design decisions that very, very much fit with the engineering perspective, and then further, 
um, amplified by the advertising business strategy that these companies have adopted because with that advertising strategy, the companies are rewarded by pushing us to look at as much information as quickly as possible. They can then uh, show us more ads and they can also gather more information, valuable information about our behavior and preferences. So I think it's those three things, the, the technology itself, the design decisions in the business that all plays into this. How was your critique received at a time of publication? Um, uh, I think th things have shifted a bit s yeah. since then, but... Uh, I think it was very, the reaction was very polarized. Um, there didn't tend to be many people in the middle. <laughs> it tended to be people who said, oh, he's completely wrong. How can you, how can you question <laughs> the, the benefits of the internet and all this information that's freely available? That used to be difficult to come by. I, I mean, I certainly admit that. And then there were other people who, who I think in some ways felt relieved that somebody had stated this. Because I think at the time, you know, there was so much enthusiasm that you felt, you felt uncomfortable raising any, skeptical, any skepticism. You felt uncomfortable doubting uh, the kind of, the, the, the utopian line that was coming. And so by, by bringing this out into the open, these concerns about how this might be damaging our thought processes, um, I, kind of, I kind of gave people who were nervous about it a way to express their, their concerns. So I, I think you had both sides at that point. What were the optimists saying 10 years ago? Um, uh, what was the utopian view of, of what the internet could, could, could fix? I think, it, I think it was very much what was put, put under the banner of democratization. Here, we had, a, we had a situation before the internet came along that it took time, and, and sometimes it took money, to gather certain kinds of information. You had to go to a library, perhaps, uh, check out books, you know, search through books, you had to, or you had to pay for access to databases or whatever. Um, so, and this was very, very true, suddenly the internet made all of this information, most of it anyway, kind of immediately available, uh, often for free, and services like Google suddenly made it easy to navigate this information and often find find the, the, the bit of information you were searching for very, very quickly. Um, so I think this, this was viewed, and th th this is a story that, that recurs over and over in the history of communication technologies. When you get uh, a new technology that opens up more information or, or allows people to communicate easier, you, you immediately get this utopian view that that simply making this more accessible is going to make people smarter, better informed, more knowledgeable. Um, and I think that was very, very much the, the utopian dream that, that we saw with the rise of the internet. But at the same time, I mean, if you look at uh, democratization, the kind of modern society is, is in, um, at least partly built on, on the newspaper business. Uh, first you have, uh, uh, um, in the 19th century, people actually becoming literate. And then you have mass, mass market newspapers and sort yeah. of an informed society. There's a lot of debate around that and also a lot of fear. Right. Um, so can we, in a sense, uh, the, 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 aren't they partly right that a more informed society will, what's the difference this time? Yeah. When we just judge things by the quantity and speed of information delivery, which is how we've looked at the internet, and it's very good at that, we lose sight of the fact that quantity and speed might not be <laughs> in the best interests of deep thinking about information. So you have to look at how the information is supplied. Um, and contrast, say, a printed book. Um, it's always been hard for people to pay attention, to screen out. We're, we're easily distractible for all sorts of evolutionary and biological reasons. So it's always been a challenge to think deeply and concentrate on things. If you think about the printed book, and, and I don't necessarily know it was designed for this purpose, but this is how it worked. It's a very good way to screen out distractions. You're literally holding up a screen in front of you and concentrating on the words many words over many pages, maybe it's an argument, maybe it's a piece of fiction, but it's a tool that encourages, I think, and, and, and in a way trains us 
to pay attention, to concentrate. You take that, that same text and supply it through a computer screen or a phone screen, which you can do, um, the effect is very, very different because the technology is not a technology that screens out distractions and interruptions. It's a technology that's designed to supply many, many uh, distractions and interruptions. So you have this text maybe, but you have hyperlinks that allow you to jump from one text to another. You have ads, you have you know, notifications from new messages coming in. You have your email inbox, you have your Facebook notifications, Instagram and stuff. It's, it's, a, it's a technology that is that can supply the same information. It may supply it much more cheaply and much more efficiently, but it supplies it in a very different way. And I think in a way that, at least on, at, during those times when, it re, when you really want people to be thoughtful and deliberate uh, and critical and skeptical, it works against those modes of deep thinking in a way that other technologies I don't think did. Well, it also sounds like we're sort of talking about outsourcing information. And of course, that we do with, with books as well. Yeah. So, so I sort of wonder, because it's the same kind of process in a sense. We, we continue to outsource, making it more available, everything from, you know, uh, 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 nothing is better for a scholar than a big library. You know, you first start with a small library, but the big library is fantastic. You can get whatever you want. Yeah. And... Um, it's just sort of an optimum outsourcing then. It's sort of saying that it comes to a point, there's a tipping point for outsourcing. Is that one way of thinking about it? There comes a tipping point when the speed and volume of information delivery begins to work against the translation of that information into knowledge. Because one thing we know about the way our mind works is that to weave information into memory, and that's when we can make all these connections and associations between far-flung facts and experiences we've had, and it's those connections and associations that are the foundation of knowledge. It's not the little bits of information that we pull out of Google. Um, when you're inundated with information, when you kind of go from from a beneficial <laughs> access to information to being to be bombarded with information, suddenly you're not creating those rich associations which require attentiveness, which require concentration. So you can, and this is kind of the irony that we didn't appreciate, I think, in, in the beginning, is that more information can actually lead to less knowledge. And it hinges on how the information is delivered and processed and how we take it in. Let's say we accept your argument that Google is making us stupid. And, um, but then we also presume, well, actually, we know this, that uh, interconnectedness is one way of, of um, uh, creating a richer knowledge environment. It's a, it's a way we develop. It's the way we're sharing knowledge with each other. So if Google is making us stupid, will then Facebook fix it? Definitely not. Um, and I have to say, uh, you know, even w when you look, I, d I don't want to be one-dimensional about this right. because it's absolutely true that that being able to access information, if you do it deliberately, and and. and and are kind of thoughtful in how you use this tool can be very powerful. And, and as a writer, a nonfiction writer, you know, Google is is extremely beneficial to me in, in many, many cases because I can find information uh, that either I wouldn't have been able to find at all or that would have taken a whole lot of time. Now, when we move to Facebook, we're, we're, we're moving into a way of supplying information that I think takes all the bad qualities <laughs> that, were, that were already there in the World Wide Web, the internet, and amplifies them enormously. Um, Why is that? Well, it's easiest just to go to Facebook to find the news, to find, uh, to inform myself about world events, and, and also to keep up with friends and family. And Facebook has, is very good at presenting this information in a way that makes us almost compulsive in going back to it. And, it, and what it does is, I think it kind of levels all information. It turns all information into to the level of banter. Um, uh, and, and I think ultimately, you know, and I think we see this in kind of the, the effects of in recent elections and how easy it is to feed propaganda through this system, how, how easy it is to get people to react emotionally 
to headlines uh, rather than thinking in any deliberate fashion. And I think it's all about the fact that we have these streams of information of all different sorts um, and tend to be very short you know, bits of information that are very much supplied to us in a way that, that seeks an emotional reaction and works against kind of rational, reasoned thinking. Um, and then there's the whole question of how it influences, how Facebook influences the way we communicate, uh, you know, beyond the, the information gathering angle. And I think there, there are, there are big problems as well. At the same time, it seems to break down the sort of a, um, a, a power structure within uh, within information use as well. So, um, two decades ago, uh, you can basically you had you had the gods of of the media in many ways, and now you find people becoming phenomenons online, uh, challenging views. Is that kind of a, is, is that a positive side of it or is it, is it also negative? Do we? I think it's both. I, I, mean, I mean, on the one hand, I think, I think whether it's Facebook or YouTube um, or any various other, you know, blogging systems or whatever, people who would have been shut out of traditional media, um, some, of, some of whom are very talented, I, I mean, and for various reasons would have been shut out, um, can gain an audience, can express themselves. And I, there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, that's, that's a welcome development. Um, but at the same time, you know, it encourages, I think it, what we're seeing is that it encourages um, a more superficial level of communication, um, which means that it's not, <laughs> it's not the deliberate, well-reasoned argument that necessarily gains attention or gains likes and retweets and stuff. It's the short, kind of very, um, very high-intensity, emotional, kind of blunt message um, that grabs attention. It, in some ways, that's always what's, what grabs your attention. If you have all sorts of information surrounding you, the kind of the, the piece that's most, <laughs> uh, most aggressively stated or, or, or whatever tends to grab your attention. So I think, it, I think you have both the good effects of opening up channels of media to people who might not have been able uh, to, 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 to express themselves otherwise, but then you have you know, the broader trend of, of what I think is a more superficial relationship to messages and information and communication. At the same time, I, I wonder if we can elaborate just a little bit on that, is it, it seems to me that this kind of information technology, also because it happens in real time, more about, and, and it tends to go towards that further and further. Before, now even on Twitter, you can see how the likes go up, likes go up uh, uh, in real time. Right. You don't even have to refresh your page. It right. will happen anyway. Right. Yeah. Um, are we seeking to sort of, um, to mimic real life experience online? Is that what's happening? I, I don't think so because I think, I mean, you could make an argument, some people have, that this is, that this is replicating old oral cultures where you, you know, express yourself and it tends to be when you're when you're talking to friends in a bar or a restaurant, you you don't you don't have book length statements. You have short, brief back and forth. And there is some of that on social media, I think, absolutely. But there but there's a big difference with that and with with expressing yourself and then immediately following these kind of reactions. Uh, so counting up the likes or the retweets, that's, a very, much, that's very much a kind of media phenomenon, uh, which, which is not, <laughs> not something from the past, not, a, not an oral tradition. It's very much, I'm gonna present myself to the world as this kind of performance or as this media object, and then I'm going to get, you know, the, the ratings for what I've done, and I'll be able to track them. That's a very, it seems to me that, that's, that's a very dangerous kind of mode of communication for people to get into 
um, on a kind of constant basis. It, it raises, you know, you're exposing yourself to an audience's judgment, and then you're following that judgment. It raise, and we see signs of this in the research. It raises things like anxiety, um, you know, even even kind of sadness, or, or, or and it and it also and it also is very good at promoting compulsive, even kind of addictive styles of behavior, because you want to get that, those responses. And Facebook knows this, and Twitter knows this. You want to get those responses, and so by giving you those immediate responses, it gets you to keep on posting, to keep on looking. Um, so, so I think, you know, I th I think by and large. It's not a return to some old-fashioned oral tradition. It's something very, very much <laughs> similar to contemporary media. What can we do to counteract, uh, counteract this? What, what, what can we do to change our own situation? Well, it's, it's very difficult, uh, and I think that needs to be said, because what, what's happened, and this is, this is also something that's an ongoing story with technology, is that the technology gets adopted very, very quickly for all sorts of reasons. The necessity, almost, of being online uh, and being in following messages and exchanging messages becomes built into society in a, in a deep way. And that has kind of happened, and it's only now, after it's happened, that people are starting to say, you know, I don't like this, what this is doing to me, or I don't like what this is doing to society, and maybe we have to rethink this. And the problem is that once, you know, a technology is entwined into social processes, it gets, it gets very, very difficult to back up and rethink what you've done. It, it's more than a matter of personal discipline. Um, having said that, I think there are, there are a couple of things that can be done. One is at the level of personal discipline, becoming a smarter user of these technologies, not throwing them away, but realizing that they're good for some types of communication, some types of information gathering, but they're not good at all for other types. So maybe, yes, you should use social media to connect with your family if your family is far away, but maybe you don't want to use it to, to inform yourself about the news. Maybe you don't want, maybe we don't want it to be a platform for political discourse. Maybe, so being more, uh, being more critical about how we use this tool as opposed to other tools. And then also there, there are basic smart things people can do if they're worried about it. You can turn off notifications. Um, you know, th this, this idea that the computer itself, independent of when you want to gather information, is gonna tell you about all these new things going on. That seems to me, you know, one of the big problems that's become more and more exaggerated, that, that you know, this is good for the companies, but it very much is, is, takes distraction to a whole nother level, because it's no longer, oh, I wanna go look, it's, it's we're gonna feed you these new stimuli all the time. Um, so being smarter about you know what you have on your phone, what what notifications you allow, what apps you have, uh, how you set up your privacy settings, all of that stuff, it seems to me, is very very important. And then also, in in this this seems less likely to happen because of the kind of momentum the technology has. But I think what I hope would happen is that we take this new concern uh, in this kind of higher level of of understanding of both the negative effects of the, and the good effects, and start asking for new way, new designs for these services uh, that aren't all about distraction and, and pushing through as much information as possible, but give more space for deliberation um, and, and for for careful, attentive thinking. I don't know that that's going to happen. I'm skeptical, but it's it's not impossible. Nicholas Carr, thank you very much. You're welcome.